Stories for Our Daughters explores the tales of everyday women from the South Asian subcontinent who've been strong, unorthodox, and extraordinary in their own unique way. Be it for the bars they've raised, the battles they've survived, the ceilings they've shattered, or the courage they've inspired. These are women we encounter in our daily lives, who, like many of us, straddled multiple geographies, distinct systems, and diverse cultures. And their compelling journeys are presented in their very own words. I'm Madhuri Baldavapat, and this is Stories for Our Daughters. My guest today, Niharika Pendekanti, is the founder and artistic director of a premier Kuchipudi Dance Institute located in Southern California, School of Indian Traditional Arts, or Sita for short. Niharika is also the founder and president of A Friend in Me, a nonprofit that caters to the social needs of children with life threatening illnesses and undergoing prolonged hospital treatments. The organization carries forward the legacy of her younger son, Rupesh who was diagnosed with leukemia when he was less than three years old. Niharika saw her little boy relapse twice, undergo an invasive bone marrow transplant and a double cord blood transplant while putting up with chemotherapy, radiation, steroids, spinal taps, and transfusions. Rupesh left this world just shy of his eighth birthday after battling the deadly disease for five years. Niharika then directed her pain to help other kids diagnosed with cancer by starting a friend in me. Today, there are 10 local school clubs working with her. Niharika funds this mission by directing 100% of the proceeds from her dance school towards pediatric cancer patients. An engineer with a graduate degree in business and a multimedia marketing entrepreneur, Niharika is also a Natya Visharat. She lives in Southern Cal with her husband, Rajesh, their children, Ritesh and Neerati, and dog, Pixie. Niharika Pendekanti, welcome to Stories for Our Daughters. It's such an honor to have you. Thank you so much, Madhuri, for inviting me to the show. And congratulations. Such a lovely concept, Stories for Our Daughters. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we will be able to do justice to all the stories that we are telling. Um, I'm going to dive into the first question right away, Niharika. Uh, do you remember how old you were when Rupesh got diagnosed at that time? I think I was about 27 years old, Madhuri. Well, 27 is a really, is really young. You know, most of us are not figure, not figure out what to do with our lives and we maybe wanted to go and, you know, like some of us are still studying in graduate school. And here you are with your second child, your younger son getting diagnosed. Um, did, did you see the illness coming? What went through your mind when the diagnosis happened? I did not see it coming. It's something you hear in the stories. You, people, you hear people talk about it. You see movies about it. But it's something that you don't think that it's going to happen to you or it's going to happen in your house, in your family. It definitely took us by surprise, uh, by shock. Rupesh was a normal delivery, normal child, normal pregnancy, everything by the books. But I do remember a couple of weeks before the actual diagnosis came, um, we had gone to a, we had gone on a biking trail on the river. Every weekend we used to go biking on the river trail. So we went, and normally he can do, he finishes the loop, but that day he couldn't finish the loop. Halfway through, he was like, mom, I'm tired. I couldn't, uh, I can't ride, I can't ride. So I just thought he was trying to be lazy and getting his way out. So I kept, but I tried to keep a concerned face and I was like, okay, I understand, let's go, let's walk it through. So we both walked our bikes um, back to the car, finished the loop. We came home, a couple of days later, he got diagnosed, not diagnosed, he had fever and a high fever actually, uh, 103 fever, which didn't go away. We took him to pediatrician. The pediatrician said, first try um, Tylenol and Motrin. He probably has something viral. Um, and then if it doesn't go away with the over-the-counter medicines, then we will go back and um, maybe prescribe antibiotics for him. 
So after four days, I, go, I took an appointment. We dropped Ritesh off at the daycare and we took Rupesh. From there, they, the doctor, I don't know why he doubted. He was like, I want to do a blood test on your son. And he did a blood test. And then he came back and he said, um, you need to go to emergency. So we went to emergency care. Um, from there, they did same thing. They did some more tests and they said, you need to be admitted to Robert Wood Johnson Hospital. So we got admitted in the hospital and then very soon got the diagnosis of leukemia. So what's going through your mind that day? Numb, nothing but numb. Like it's not something that you're prepared for or you would assume or you would, you can, like you think that you'll get it. So all the while we didn't understand why we were being sent from one place to the other place. And then the diagnosis came and that too at a very high uh, white blood cell count, which was about 270,000 where a normal person has about 11,000 white blood cell count. So if we were, yeah, we were numb. So this is not a diagnosis that anybody like, you know, you, like you said, you were not prepared for. So what, yeah. what were the next 48 to 72 hours, like next two to three days like for you? Do you remember or is it a big blur? What are the steps you had to take? It's both. It's a blur, but at the same time, I remember the state of mind, um, like a war zone. That's about it. It was more about how are we going to handle both the boys and what are we going to do? What is it? And even trying to understand, trying to, to understand what the doctors are saying, what it means, and uh, as for the treatment, what it means to the kids, what it means to us as a family, just trying to process all the information. Right. Did you, did you have support like from the community or friends or family, you know, because you already had a, you have the younger son being diagnosed, but you have another son, he's slightly older, but only a year and a half older. Yeah. So did you, what kind of support system did you have to bank on at that time? Family. Family was the biggest support throughout the treatment for us throughout all the five years. We had both sets of uh, parents always backing us. Um, they took turns taking care of Ritesh, um, even if it is staying in the hospital for a little bit with Rupesh, giving Rupesh that courage, encouragement, uh, taking care of Ritesh, making sure he's not missing his school and his activities. We always had um, our parents, our siblings, our family, so grateful to have them with us. Right. Um, your mom tells me that you were very courageous throughout this process, you know, and she says you always gave Rupesh instructions or, um, you know, information on what to expect, you know, that there would be pain or that, you know. So um, how do you explain to a three-year-old child, you know, what kind of pain or what to expect? So how, how do you manage that? And what made you think that that is the way to do it? That was a conscious effort from me and my husband Rajesh that we always wanted to be open with kids, not just about this. In general, our life principle was be open and honest with the kids and tell them everything. That's how we've been, we've raised them. So the, it doesn't matter whether it's a cancer diagnosis, the treatment or anything. We were very upfront and open with them. We try to explain it. Um, like for example, Rupesh got a portacat um, for his treatment or for his blood draws because they do so frequently that they put in a portacat for easy access. So how do you tell a two and a half or three year old kid that they're going to put a device here in your heart and that's what they're going to access it every single time they're going to come and poke a needle into right there into your chest. So that was something we then we told him he used to watch Power Rangers, um, the animation show, and we told him he's becoming a Power Ranger. All Power Rangers have a badge here. So we told him that he's getting, um, he's becoming a Power Ranger and they're admitting him into their league. So he has to get that badge. So that was one way. Um, when he lost his hair, we tried to connect it to, he used to watch Avatar, The Last Airbender, in which the Avatar is bald. He's a kid, but he doesn't have any hair. So we told him that he's like the Avatar, that's why he's losing his hair. 
And we told him once he fights off the cancer, he can get his tattoo if he wants or whatever tattoo he wants, like the last airbender. <laughs> so we kind of tried to connect uh, things for him like that. Um, when he used to get um, MRI or uh, CT scans, you know, how do you tell in an MRI, how do you tell a three-year-old kid that you go into the MRI scan machine and not move at all, like you have to stand still? Right. So we told him uh, about everything, you know, we told him not to get claustrophobic, it's all okay. And we used to, we talked to the technicians and we were, you know, we could talk to him every now and then on the inter, on the system. And then we asked if they could play his favorite music, SpongeBob music, um, mm -hmm. while he's getting the treatment, things like that, you know. Um, yeah, we found our little, little ways to try and be always upfront with them. I think that helped him get through the treatment without much fuss. I remember even the nurses would say, um, we've never seen, uh, most kids cannot take the pills or the blood draws like how Rupesh does. I think um, that gave us that extra courage or extra encouragement to keep doing that. I must ask you, Niharika, you know, you're talking about all of these procedures that he's going through. I remember when my daughter, she was not even a year old and she had to go through two procedures. You know, she had to be poked and prodded and then things were went down her nose and her throat. And I was just losing it. I couldn't handle it. Every time she was poked, I would cry and I would feel like my heart is being squished. Here you are with your three-year-old and he's going through all of these traumatic procedures, you know, and facing a disease of this nature. How did you go through it? I mean, he's going through it, but you're also going through it with him. Like what, what's going through your mind? What's the pain that, and how are you dealing with it? There is, I wish I had an option. Let me put it that way. Yeah. I wish I had an option to not go through with it. So that's how I always took it. I don't have an option. And that's what I told my kids too. Okay, you got it. You're diagnosed with cancer. Now, what are you going to do? What Do you have an option? Are you, are you going to sulk about it and think, why me? Why do I have to go through this? Or are you going to fight it off and come out, you know, shining through it? So that's that was the state of mind and that's what i tried to tell my kids too yeah, what a wonderful thought you know we're all a product of our childhood and our upbringing so i'm still wondering you know where did you draw that kind of strength from because yes you don't have an option but you know there are a lot of people who can who, who don't go through it as courageously as you did you know your mother tells that your you know rajesh your husband he talks about that as well so I, I'm still curious about where did you find the strength? So where did you, you're, you're, you're that strong person for your kids. You're, you're putting that, you know, you're putting on that facade of strength for them. But I'm sure there were moments when you were like, I can't do this anymore, you know? So where did you draw your strength from? Who was, who was your pillar? My courage and strength comes um, from my grandmother and my mom. They both are very strong women. And, um, they knew how to fight their battles. So that's what I grew up with. That's what I saw. I never saw not being brave as an option as when I grew up. So I carried that forward. My kids too, I draw my strength from Rajesh and my kids, you know. Rupesh is the one who's actually going through the physical pain of it, all the side effects, everything that comes with it the least I can do is give him that courage, give him that support, give him that boost to go through with it. And that's what we became. We all became one team and um, we were one unit fighting against it. So your child is going through all of this pain and all of these procedures. One of the things when I was talking to your wonderful mom, you know, Chandrika Suramfudi, uh, it was such a joy to speak with her as a part of the process. Um, but when I was speaking with her, she said, one of the things you and Rajesh would do is undergo some of the procedures that were allowed on yourself so that you would know what the pain is or what the, you know, what, what the procedure was and, you know, how much discomfort he would be in. Tell me about that. 
you know, obviously you cannot get through, um, you cannot get the same spinal tap or um, the blood draws or things like that be done on you, like the treatments that would go on Rupesh. But we kind of tried to gauge wherever we could, whatever we could, so that we can prep him better to handle it. Like, for example, um, when they would do a spinal tap, there was times when we had to put a topical anesthetic cream. So by the time you, the doctor said, like, you put it at home, and by the time you come to the hospital and get to the procedure, that area would have been already numb. So, um, so we used to, like, put it first. Um, the first time we got it, we put it on a small area on our, uh, on our skin to see how long it takes for that area to become numb. So that, that way we can plan accordingly on Rupesh. Um, for him to understand about finger prick and to give him the same um, concept that we are all in this together kind of thing. If he was getting a finger prick um, the first couple of times when he was getting, to tell him, to teach him that it's okay to get a finger prick um, for the blood draw was, I used to poke myself with a small uh, safety pin to show that it's okay, it's gonna ouch, but it's okay. You know, you can tolerate it. You're strong enough to take that pain. So those are the little, little kind of things we used to do. Um, he, he had to take, um, sometimes when he had to take a medicine or a, um, yeah, medicine, which is so bad to taste, but he had to do it to get to the next step of his testing. Um, we told him that we would drink something which is as nasty to give him that support. So we all used to do shots of it. We would put cups in front of him. So whatever is the nasty, he could, he could pick for us what was the nastiest thing that we don't want to drink. And we would put cups and then we would all take shots of it along with him. So that was a way of a, for us to show support that and to tell him that we are all in this together. <laughs> he picked for me, I'm, I'm a very coffee person. I don't like um, black coffee at all. I need a ton load of sugar and cream in my <laughs> coffee. So he made me drink extra strong, extra bitter, dark coffee. So imagine taking shots of that. Right. You know, Aniharika, this is such a sweet uh, story. You know, I'm, I'm wondering at this stage, what were those moments of joy and laughter, even in those, you know, during those days that helped you? Family time. Uh, we used to watch movies together still, even if it is in the hospital. Um, we, Rupesh was a very funny guy. So the kind of books he's into, the comics he's into, he was always, um, he had a funny bone in him. So he, he always had a little fart machine. So anytime a doctor would come inside or a nurse would come inside, he would press that and laugh that they did that. And I'm grateful that the doctors and the nurses also along, went along with him um, for birthday celebrations and all because we could never celebrate it out with anybody else. We used to celebrate it in the hospital. We used to have treasure hunts for the kids as their birthday gifts. And the nurses and the doctors and the technicians were all much part of our treasure hunt. Um, anytime he would get a little um, leverage or little gap time between his medicine and they would unhook him from the IV pole, he would run away. Um, or if he's, in a, if he's on an IV pole and he still has the energy, we would just, he would stand on the IV pole and I would take him out for a stroll like that. Um, things like that. So here you are in the hospital, Niharika, you're with Rupesh all the time, you know, all your mental bandwidth and all your physical capacity is being spent on this younger child who is in so much pain, right? But you also have an older child and he's only slightly older, like a year and a half older. And, um, and he doesn't have a normal childhood now anymore, right? He's in the hospital with you. And you know he doesn't have birthday parties he's going to or soccer practices he's going through. Um, did you did you and Rajesh worry about you know what impact this is having on him or that he's losing out in his childhood or did you have no mental bandwidth to think about that at that time? It's both. Um, we were so overwhelmed and into the treatment, and it was a family affair. It was not Rupesh is battling and we are there. It's It was all of our battle. And Ritesh was very much a part of the whole uh, treatment and the procedures and everything. 
Ritesh, actually, I'm a very proud mom. He's a bone marrow donor to Rupesh. He was a 100% match for his brother. So he donated his bone marrow when he was seven years old. And he still says it till today. Um, if that would give Rupesh extra years of life, I would do it again and again to keep my brother along with me. Ritesh did sacrifice a lot. Uh, he was always there at the hospital. He was there trying to help Rupesh cope with treatments, with the procedures, trying to distract him. He did miss out on his childhood uh, quite a bit. He, along with Rupesh, he, was, he also maintained his social distance. He did not go to movies with anybody else other than the four of us. He did not get his Chuck E. Cheese parties. He did not get um, his baseball games. He did not get his taekwondo lessons. Right. When, when Ritesh is, you know, is being prepped for, for, the, you know, for bone marrow transplant surgery, right? So your, your older child is being wheeled away for that. Your younger child is suffering. As a mother, what's, how are you coping with it? And so here you are dealing with two little children, a young woman yourself. You know, take me through what's happening. Take me through that pain and trauma if you can. And please forgive me, please, uh, for this question. No worries, Madhuri. I did have my um, weak moments. I did have my um, stressful days. I did go through the trauma just like any mom would. Um, yeah, they, that was one of the toughest days for me in my life is my two kids drawn in two different ways in the same hospital. One was going through the bone marrow draw and the other one was going to get the bone marrow transplant with just finished his radiation and his all his blood counts at zero so that he can accept the bone marrow. And there was a time when both the kids were on the hospital bed in the same hospital on different floors. One is trying to recover and one is trying to regenerate healthy cells. I don't know what's the right word to put it. It was very tough. I didn't know which room I should be in or which son I should be with. Um, the earliest when Ritesh could move out of his room, I wheelchaired him next to Rupesh. And yeah, that was one of the toughest um, days I had to go through. All right. So um, how did you manage the home and the hospital situation? Because you were in the hospital with Rupesh all the time. Um, Daddy and the older son are at home. You and Rupesh are in the hospital. Like, how did the family dynamic work at that time? I am so grateful and thankful to our both sets of parents who were always there. My family, the biggest support the backbone for us throughout this whole thing. We are a tighter and closer knit family now because of the all this we went through together, all the battles we went through together. Ritesh used to go to school and then come back to hospital directly. I had either my, my parents and Rajesh's parents took turns actually coming from India and staying here while um, Rupesh was in the hospital. That way there was somebody with Ritesh, you know, to take care of his day-to-day -day needs. But most of the days he would go to the school, Ritesh would go to the school, come back to the hospital, and we pretty much lived more than half the day at the hospital. There was a time actually we had rented an RV and we put it right there at the hospital so that we could cook for Rupesh, um, home, home cooked meals, things like that. So Niharika, you know, one of the things I've always observed about you and Rajesh, you know, uh, and not only me, all of our friends, whoever have seen you together, have seen that both of you really dote on each other and love and respect each other. Like, you know, he talks about you with so much love and affection. And when you are talking about him, you talk about him with so much respect and adoration. Um, and you've been married for 25 years, so you can't really, this can't be an act for 25 years. And uh, we're all in awe of how much you both love each other. But we still, all of us know, whoever has been married, that marriage is hard. And especially, you know, mix it in with such a traumatic experience, and it really can go off the rails. How did your relationship evolve during that time? 
Thank you so much, Madhuri, for think. That's so sweet of you to think of us like that. Thank you. But if anything, actually, that um, whole time period brought us, um, made our relationship stronger. We feel like if we could get through that toughest time in any parent's life like that, we can handle it. It actually brought us together in the sense we both were in it together. We both supported each other. We saw each other for the people we are. Um, we did not know each other. We knew each other till then as a spouse, as a you know better half or wife and husband kind of thing. But this time period put us um, forefront because each of us was handling one section of the family life. If I was with Ritesh, Rajesh was with Rupesh. If I was with Rupesh, Rajesh was with Ritesh. And if I was handling the hospital, Rajesh was handling the family, the house. If I was handling the house, Rajesh was handling the hospital part. Of. So I think that gave us an opportunity to see each other as an individual. As um, And we both, it was our growing age too. So we both became stronger and we both grew together. So I think that brought us even more closer. Right. So as a family, all of you are going through this trauma, but then, you know, then the good thing happens, right? So what happens is he is in remission. He gets okay. And at that time, um, so tell us about that time. So how, what, was the, you know, what was the feeling of elation at that time when you are like, okay, this is done. This is behind us. Did you, did you worry about the impact of chemo and all the treatment he's had on his long-term health at that time? So, you know, take me through that a little bit. At that time, it was always one step at a time, one baby step at a time kind of thing. The, when he first went through the first round of, um, he actually, Rupesh, relapsed twice. First, he was diagnosed when he was two and a half years old. And then when he got through three years of chemo, and then he was all good, doing very well, went back to school, did, um, got back into his taekwondo, his soccer, his music lessons, and then again, he relapsed. That's when the doctor said, this time we got to do um, chemo radiation and then a bone marrow transplant. We were grateful that Ritesh was a 100% match to do the bone marrow donation. So first time around with the chemo, he, re he got into remission in one month. That was like on the dot, um, really good news for us. So we were very hopeful. We thought we put this all behind us. It was just getting through the three years of the treatment and then we are done with this. But then again, he relapsed. So this time, even though we, we were shocked, it was something that all the doctors always tell you, you know, there is always a possibility of a relapse. And since Ritesh was a hundred percent match, he was back in remission in 21 days since the bone marrow transplant. That is such a quick recovery time. So we, again, we thought, okay, we are all done. You know, It's just finishing the protocol and finishing the treatment is gonna be all good. But then again, he relapsed. This time the doctor said, you know, the doc same bone marrow transplant is not gonna do that because if it was gonna do it, it would have helped. So this time we, would, we should do a double cord blood transplant. He needs stronger. So then um, we did the double cord blood transplant. Uh, he was getting into remission, but I think his body took a toll. By then he had had so many treatments and so many procedures that I think the body took a toll. So I have so many questions at this stage. One is, what is a double cord blood transplant? You know, I should know it, but can you tell us what, it, what that meant for him? It's a cord blood um, that which they say it is full of, uh, healing cells, um, that potent cells that can cure this. Mm -hmm. So it's the blood from the umbilical cord that is normally discarded after a baby is born, uh, the cord that connects the mom and the baby. So that is one um, cord blood. So because he was older by then, he was seven years old uh, and the baby's umbilical cord has only so much, they needed two cords to transplant for his age and for his size. How did you get that? This is another place where I felt the strength of my family and friends and the support. We did a never before heard kind of cord blood drive. 
So everybody was very apprehensive when I wanted to do the double cord blood, not double cord blood drive, because how are you going to know when the baby is coming? How are you going to, you can, you can organize a blood drive. You can organize a bone marrow, uh, like a testing drive, but how do you do a bl cord blood drive? That was something I was able to actually achieve with the support of NMDP, which is the national um, bone marrow um, organization. And then there is its national marrow donor program. And then um, with the help of all the, all the friends, the cousins, uh, and the family that are across the US. So we formed a chain, a link, where we put a quick website. If anybody is pregnant and they're willing to donate their cord blood, they register. And one of us would get the cord blood collection kit to them. And they would, you know, and we coordinated this with NMDP and STEM site, which is a local um, cord blood bank. And we had launched this program. And uh, we found two cord blood matches for Rupesh. It was not through this particular program, but in the process, we found a match for him uh, and we were able to do the cord blood transplant. So I'm sure at that time you're thinking, oh, this is a lucky break. And yet yes. you were saying, you know, his body had taken a toll with all the procedures. Do you remember how many procedures he went through? He had gone through 780, I would say three, I think approximately it's close that he has gone through a lot of um, procedures, which is blood draws, uh, spinal taps, uh, bone marrow draws, uh, blood transfusions, so many of them. So actually he was part of a Beats of Courage program in which they encourage um, kids who are going through treatment by every time they go through a treatment, they went through a hospital procedure, they would be given a card, they would be given a small bead, which um, the color of it represents the procedure or the process that they have gone through. So Rupesh was very proud of it. He, he used to hang it on his IV pole and he would make me diligently collect every bead, even though he had no energy. He's like, mom, I got my shot. You got to go get the bead for it. So the nurses would give him. Actually, the uh, founder of the program um, made a special bead for Rupesh because he uh, he hung on to it so dearly and he valued it so much that she made a special bead for him. So yeah, he went through 783 procedures, yes. Wow, that's a lot, you know, even for, I can't even imagine, <laughs> to be very honest, excuse me, I'm going to take a break here. So before this meeting with you, I had a meeting with Rajesh, just to get some background information on, you know, some of these topics. And uh, this is, and one of the questions I asked him was, you know, his body is kind of giving up did he know about it and you know what was what was that like and i want to share that clip with you and then we come back and talk about that from your perspective is that okay Miharika? sure okay. does that moment come back when you thought okay you know a, a, a few people have mentioned that when this was happening they knew it was the last moment with their child they knew it it, it was obvious to them did you also know that it was coming, the end was near for Rupesh and you could sense it and you knew it was coming? Does, do you relive that moment anytime or does it come back and haunt you anytime? I, re I do relive that moment very, very often. Uh, that, I mean, I wouldn't say haunt, but it's actually every moment with him was a sweet moment. So, do I relive it? Absolutely, very, very, very often. And, uh, you know, the day before Father's Day, the doctor essentially came and said, hey, not good news for you, but you're going to lose Rupesh on Father's Day. And, uh, Rupesh made it through all of Father's Day and right after midnight, he passed away. 
the sweetest gift is given me, right? Every Father's Day is Harika, what was your state of mind that last week and when, you know, the doctor came and told you this? It was one of the toughest periods, times of our lives that we had to go through. That was nothing ever can prepare you for those kind of moments. The one thing that was different the third time that he was going through the treatment. I don't know. He always used to ask me with that time. I don't think I'm going to make it mom, he used to say. And I never wanted to hear that. I used to tell him, no, you have to stay positive. If you think like that, it's not, you know, you have to be in the fighting spirit. And that's what I used to tell him all the time. Uh, I remember even when they gave the double cord blood transplant, um, when they were hanging the bags, one of the bags, he was like, mom, can you take it off of me? He used to ask, like, he never asked me those questions before. It was tough. Same thing, we did not have an option. I wish we had an option to keep him alive. I wish we had an option for him to have us running between, you know, with us. It is what it is. He, in a way, he fought, he fought hard, he fought very hard. And he's now pain free. Um, you know, you lived any and every parent's worst nightmare. Yes. And yet your days and years were filled taking care of him and doing it so diligently. You know, your mom says that doctors and nurses in the hospital with who you built a really great relationship with over time, said, we've never seen parents such as you and Rajesh. You know, they actually used to say that. That's what your mother told me. And now suddenly there is a vacuum, you know. He's left this world. You know, what were the next few hours and days like for you? Were you angry with the world and justifiably so? Was, was you know, I mean, again, I beg your forgiveness, but can you tell us, you know, how you, how you coped with that kind of sorrow? It was hard. I did not know what to do with myself. I did not know what to do with anything actually. Mm -hmm. I did not even know at that time um, when Rupesh passed away and they asked me if I, after they unhooked him from all the IVs and everything and they asked me if I wanted to hold him. I said, yeah, and I didn't know anything after that. Like I remember holding him in my arms like this and then I did not even know what to do from there. Having my child dead in my arms and I didn't know what to do. From there, it was really hard. Um, I, I remember, and I still do sometimes actually, I, I'm, because both my boys were so young in age and they were so close to each other, I always held both their hands and walked anywhere. I remember taking them to the daycare or anywhere I went, I had one in my arms and I had one in the car seat. And that with both of them wearing heavy snow jackets in New Jersey and then holding them, me like a big pahalwan like this and walking. I, I remember that. So I kept, I still do that actually a lot of times. My hand keeps looking for the other hand to hold. I still feel that emptiness. And I remember, like I still do every so often, like I want to hug, like I put my arms around and I can feel that emptiness. Even as I hug Ritesh or Nerati, or I still feel that it feels like a big hole in in the middle of the donut. That's yeah. All I can hold on to now is his memory. That's what I feel. Like I don't want to let go of the pain or the suffering or the ordeal he has went through. 
because that's all I have left to hold on to. Rupesh. Okay. You know, and I'm sure this, all of this, this trauma took a toll on your health as well. Yes. Yes. And uh, would you be okay sharing what, what you were going through at the tail end of this? Like, how did it impact you physically and emotionally? I did put on a lot of weight. Um, I mean, I've never, I've never been the skinny one to begin with, but I put on a lot more weight when I was, when Rupesh was going through the treatment because I would binge eat, stress eat. And then even, even when he was going through the treatment, my routine checkups, the doctor would say, your blood pressure is going high. I think you need to come back and get your medicines. I never, I had a lot on my plate. I did not care much, but the end result is now I'm, I am still on high blood pressure medications. Um, my um, weight gain, I keep, my battle with the weight gain is still on. I put on weight, I lose weight. And then again, I put on weight. I still do when I'm stressed. Yeah. So, you know, you've gone through this pain, you've gone through this trauma, and you're on the other side. And then you decide to have another child, right? Um, and tell me about the thought that went into having that child. The answer is many reasons, actually. Um, I would start with why not? Because I could, I, I still could have kids. And it's also a mom's wishful thinking, right? I want him to come back to me. I want him to, if he went to heaven, I want him to say, no, no, my mom is still available. I still want to go back to that family. And I wanted him to come back. It was that wishful thinking. Right. But, and then I, I wanted my son Ritesh to grow up with siblings. I wanted him to have the family that I grew up with. I have two brothers, so I want that same thing for him. So it was a no brainer to get pregnant again and have uh, Nirati. Right, and you know, congratulations on that because she's such Thank a you. beautiful and healthy and loving child. Yes. So I want to take you back to that moment. You know, you've had this loss. You've obviously gone through a lot of pain because I know that having her was not an easy process for you. You had a miscarriage yes. before that, you told me. And then, you know, you've gone through a, a very hard pregnancy from what Rajesh and your mom tell me, right? Yes. Uh, you had bed rest and then eventually comes back this little child and you hold her in your arms for the first time. You take us through what went through your mind when you and Rajesh held her for the first time. <laughs> That's an interesting question you ask. Nirati was a preemie. Mm -hmm. She was born five weeks early mm -hmm. and she was born less than four pounds. And we were not allowed to hold her right away uh, because she had to go into the neonatal care. Even when they were ready to send me back to the hospital, Rajesh was very afraid because she was so tiny. She was less than four pounds and he was like, it's okay, we can wait one more week, he goes. <laughs> and then I was like, no, 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 I'm not leaving the hospital without my baby. <laughs> so she was really tiny, but my happiness knew no bounds. You know, that was my ray of hope, our ray of, she definitely brought in the happiness. She brought in um, the new life, new spirit back to the family. Right. And how did Ritesh, because by this time Ritesh was almost 10, 11, you know, uh, how yeah. old was he when Nirati was born? When Nirati was born, Ritesh was almost um, 11. Yes, yeah, 11 years old. Yeah, so he, now Nirati is now 10 years old and uh, yeah. Ritesh is what, 22, 23 now? 22. 22 years old. And um, do you talk about Rupesh with both of them, especially the little one? Yes, that is one thing we have always talked to Nirati about. Initially, when she was a baby, she didn't understand much. Yeah. We just told her that he is her brother who's in heaven. Mm -hmm. So initially, she used to think he's in heaven. When is he going to come back? When is he going to come to our house? 
but eventually um, she understood. We talked to her. Like I said, we've always been very open and very, um, we discussed everything with all our kids. Um, that's how we did it with Nirati too. Right, right. And Nitesh adores her. He was the one who picked the name for Nirati. Mm-hmm. Of course, not completely by himself. We've given him some choices to pick and he picked this name. Mm-hmm. And he was in. He was at the hospital. Uh, he initially, he was upset because in the neonatal care they wouldn't let him hold Nirati. So he was very upset that he couldn't hold his sister. He is very much part. He is like a parent to Nirati now. <laughs> right. And so now you know you have a full family again, and you started. When did you start a friend in me? Like at what point did you say this is how I want to do it? And I also want to talk about the panda bear that's behind you and also the logo of yes. uh, a friend in me. So I'm sure that has some significance. So why don't yes, you talk a little bit about a friend in me? Definitely. Um, I went into hibernation after Rupesh. I did not want to talk with anybody. I did not want to do anything with the world. I just, I was in a shell. After Nirati was born and slowly I started feeling that new life, new energy, and started coming out. That is when I decided, um, okay, we were at the receiving end at one time, and those were the ones that gave Rupesh a little bit, um, you know, smile, that broad smile on his face. So I wanted to see whatever I could do to do that. Our normal moments, that was, you asked me what is our most memorable events or most memorable time. Anytime we did a normal activity, anytime we watched a movie together, anytime we had our own party together, or anytime an organization would come and have a pajama night or, you know, like an ice cream social, those were the moments for us. Um, those were the ones, anytime we had a Halloween parade, um, those are the memories that we hang on to now. So that's what I wanted to create, see if I could do. So. I started um, giving back to the hospital uh, from, I started teaching my dance back. I used to dance before. And then I started teaching dance and any money that came in, I started putting it back towards, you know, doing things at the hospital, be it be refilling the food pantry for the families to eat, be it be toy chest for the kids. Uh, which is an instant gratification when they get a treatment. I started doing those little by little, little by little. And then slowly the hospital also were able to see, okay, do you think we could see as you keep giving, you could see where there is more need and started doing that. And then one year the nurses asked, um, our teenagers are always asking for a prom, our young adults. Is it something... um, Uh, In our regular meetings, I was asking them, what can I do? What can I do? So that's when they told me that, is it something that you can do? I said, I don't know. We'll give it a try. I haven't gone to a prom myself. So that's when I started thinking and brainstorming. And then everybody suggested that we should form a nonprofit organization so that we can do the event and we can raise funds for it. So then I was talking to one of our family friends in the same way and thinking, of we'll do an organization and he was like okay so if you did an organization what name do you think you want to give instantly it came to my mind it's like it's going to be a friend in me because that was you got a friend in me from the toy story movie was his comfort song anytime anything he was going through a rough time a rough patch or if he was scared he would sing to himself you got a friend in me you got a friend in me so that that has become to a certain extent the motto of our family So I said, okay, let's do a friend in me. That's what it's going to be the name. And then he asked, okay, so what do you see as a logo? He was just asking me back and forth questions like this in a phone conversation. And then I said, panda, I need a panda. And him, you know, a boy, because he always clinged on to a panda. That was his favorite toy. And he collected so many pandas. Every time we went to the hospital, um, you should, uh, the hospital room had, full of panda toys on top of all the shelves, on his IV poles, on his bed, everywhere. Even when he went to radiation or chemotherapy, a panda went with him. This panda went with him. That's dots. Please meet dots. <laughs> That's, and he was known in the hospital as a panda boy. Oh, That's what yeah. people call him 
because of the gazillion gazillion pandas he collected right right so that's it next day morning he sent me the slogo Mm -hmm. Normally, when I go through my multimedia stuff, we go through a few back and forth corrections and saying, "Okay, this works." This. That was it. It was like the panda, the boy, a friend in me logo. He sent me that logo, and I said, "It's meant to be. Come on, let's do it." And then we did it. And then from there on, everything I felt like I still feel like it's Rupesh who's telling us, "Okay, this is what you need to do. This is what the kids need right now. This is what." um you should and everything kept flowing that way once we formed the organization it became non profit very quickly it became um the hospital started following we started following the protocol we got the approvals um the clubs formed the high school clubs formed and the prom became our signature even the kids love it and we love doing it and through the prom it's so great to see um, we also do monthly events where i told you that the normalcy that's what we try to take to the hospital these kids who are in the hospital room all the time we want to give them a reason to come out we want the to give them a reason to interact with other kids you know these kids don't get to go to school these kids don't get to go to parties these kids don't get to go to chuckie cheese anything so it gives them a reason to come out and interact with other kids so that's what we started doing and it just grew from there that's such a lovely thing that you're doing niharika if other schools or school clubs want to get involved and want to help how should they reach out so a friend in me has clubs in local schools and actually in universities also okay. in middle schools high schools and universities you just start the club and we have uh, mentors who can guide them through the process with each school has a different process so they will guide them through that and then once they got they get approval and they are a registered club then they become part of our monthly event so they take turns interacting with these kids planning an activity taking the activity to these kids and i think it is such an important um part in this current state of world is to raise responsible and compassionate kids to become good human beings so that they understand what they have and what the other person is going through we actually train these kids and guide them to what questions they can talk what they shouldn't be talking you know how to make them give them that confidence and things like that uh, so where like how should they reach out to you or the organization or the we have a website um of www.afriendinme.org and we have a contact form on that so they can just send us an email contact us through that and say um we want to start a club and then we can go from there okay. they can also email us to friends at a friend in me.org friends at a friend in me.org yes okay got it okay so i do run a dance studio called sita school of indian traditions and arts um dance has been a part of my life all along um i'm not joking when i say i learn to walk and dance at the same time <laughs> and a friend in me is that's what keeps me close to my close to rupesh and that's what where my heart is you know a friend in me true to its name it really became an organization because of the friends that friends because of my friends and because of the friendships we give to the hospital kids niharika it has been such a joy and a pleasure to talk with you you've had you're such an inspiration and you know you're such a model for strength and motherhood so thank you thank you for talking with me thank you for this time and good luck with a friend in me i can't wait to see where you take it from here thank you thank you madre